So welcome back. In this uh, video, we're going to talk about some of the challenges around innovation and some of the public policies that can help uh, firms coordinate when they need to um, and uh, have the correct incentives to innovate. Um, so one of the things that uh, we want to talk about is that there's a lot of uh, externalities, right? External effects of innovation. Um, and that can mean that there are sort of positive externalities, negative externalities. Uh, and sometimes public policy can uh, help um, focus efforts in order to uh, reduce those. So if you think about, you know, um, climate change, there are a lot of positive externalities to uh, coming up with uh, alternatives to burning fossil fuels. Um, but, you know, if we don't capture those uh, positive externalities in the innovation process, uh, then those technologies will be underprovided. There's also coordination problems, right? So there's the coordination problem where, you know, my innovation works well with your innovation, but I'm not going to innovate if you don't innovate and vice versa. Um, and then there's also, you know, the, the coordination problem of standards, right? So we could be developing rival standards, only one of them is going to be successful. Uh, and so we want to think about what to do about that. There's also the issue that uh, knowledge is, is non-rival, right? If I know something that doesn't prevent you from knowing it, if you know something that doesn't prevent me from knowing it. Um, and so we have to think about, you know, what types of knowledge we want to protect, right? Through the things like patents and copyright, what types of knowledge we don't want to protect. Um, so, you know, things like, you know, the laws of physics um, or just, you know, regular scientific knowledge, we don't necessarily want that to be only used by, you know, one group of people, but that means it might be underprovided by the private sector. And so that's an area in which the government can uh, provide funding in order to uh, encourage uh, production of that type of knowledge. And then finally, especially in the digital age, we have these economies of scale and winner take all production uh, or competition where we, you know, there might be a large fixed cost to the innovation, but after that, there are very low marginal costs. And that means that your average cost is falling along all uh, reasonable you know, quantities of production. That's going to lead to a natural monopoly, right? And we have to then think about, okay, well, if we only have one firm in the market, they are going to be exercising monopoly power. What do we as a government uh, want to do about that, if anything? So... We can think about these sort of innovation uh, issues of coordination in terms of whether or not innovations are complements and so they work together or they are substitutes, right? So you use one instead of the other. Um, so we have both a, uh, a fictional example and a real example here. For the complements, we have uh, Netflix, and, Netflix and Plug Car. The idea is that they work together um, and this is important for, you know, if you think about uh, electric cars and charging stations, right? We need them to both exist if they're both going to be successful. Um, and so we want to, you know, encourage things like charging stations so that people feel comfortable buying uh, electric cars. So in this case, if we think about, uh, you know, the innovate, do not innovate um, possibilities, then we have uh, two Nash equilibria, right? So if Netflix innovates, plug cars choosing between one and zero, they would choose one. So we either underline or put a circle there. If they do not innovate, then plug cars choosing between minus 0 0.5, where they have to pay the innovation cost, but they don't get the rewards, or zero, zero is better. So we put a circle or underline there. Similarly, if plug car innovates, Netflix is choosing between one and zero. So one's better. So we put a dot or underline there. And if they do not innovate, the Netflix is choosing between minus 0 0.5 and zero. Zero is better. And so we put a dot or underline there and, and we get two um, Nash equilibria. And so what we would want to do in terms of policy here is, you know, allow these two companies to coordinate or what the market might do is some sort of uh, horizontal integration, right? Where plug card might buy Netflix or vice versa. Um, and that's what we see, for example, with Tesla um, providing all of their charging stations. They basically said, all right, well, we need these charging stations in order to be successful. We're not going to wait on other people to do it. We're going to do it ourselves. 
Um, if innovations are substitutes, then we might get some some wasteful innovation, right? Where uh, we might both end up innovating. So the example here is VHS and Betamax, which might be a little bit old for a lot of our uh, audience here. Um, it's even a little bit before my time. Um, but we had a similar example with um, HD, DVD, and Blu-ray, uh, and really only one standard is going to be successful, right? We don't want to have to have both VHS and Betamax or both HD, uh, DVD, and uh, Blu-ray. And so here we, the Nash equilibria are for one firm to innovate and the other firm not to innovate. But that's not what we saw really in either example, right? What we saw is, is this uh, top left square where they both innovate um, because they both feel that they have a product that will be profitable and they're both probably correct, right? But only one was going to win. And so VHS won out in uh, videotapes, um, Blu-ray won out in, um, in the HD DVD world. But of course, now everything is streaming. And so you could argue that they, they both lost in the end. So in terms of public policy solutions, right, we might want to allow um, coordinated decision making between firms, right? Usually we don't want firms to be talking together uh, because usually it ends up in some sort of collusion. Um, but in some cases, uh, coordination might be appropriate. And so oftentimes governments will allow firms to coordinate with a very limited scope. Um, we also might want to allow private exchanges between firms so that they can bargain. Um, so, you know, if you sell X number of electric cars, I'll produce X number of charging stations, uh, things like that. With substitutes, um, standards are really important, right? Um, and so here there's a balance between allowing government to throw their weight behind a standard, um, which might limit technological innovation versus, you know, having both innovations sort of fight it out in the marketplace and, you know, have a little, some somewhat wasteful uh, innovation. Um, if we could, you know, if we could coordinate, we might settle on, on a, a unique solution. I mean, I think it's interesting, right? When you think about say USB-C chargers versus, you know, Apple's lightning charger, I, I don't know that one is better than the other, but it's certainly worse for consumers that both exist, right? And we'd prefer to have all the same so that we could use our charging cables in, you know, no matter what the, the smartphone or tablet or, or laptop was. Um, and certainly Europe has sort of pushed more in that direction uh, than the United States. The United States is more likely to allow firms to sort of do what they want there. Another issue uh, is this idea of economies of scale, right? Where there's a large fixed cost of innovation. Um, and we can call those the sort of first copy costs. And in this case, it's especially important in digital, uh, in the digital world, right? So when we think about, you know, digital music, digital books, digital software, digital movies, there's a big fixed cost to producing um, the song, the software, the movie, um, but then because of our digital world, the marginal cost is very, very low. And so that's basically what this graph is saying, right? We have a very large fixed cost amount, um, but then our marginal cost, the blue line here is just one. And so we have an average cost that's decreasing uh, through, you know, basically all quantities. And when we have a decreasing average cost, that's going to provide monopoly power. Now, that's going to be more important in some areas than others, right? So if it's music, there's still a lot of competition between music. So, you know, if Taylor Swift decides to charge $5 per song, she's going to have a lot of competition in terms of what people listen to. Um, if Warner Brothers decides to charge more for their movies um, than, you know, Disney, they're going to have a lot of competition. They won't necessarily have that much pricing power. But if there are other things that are more, um, you know, monopolized, for instance, you know, Microsoft Office uh, before Google Docs came around was uh, very much a monopoly, um, then, you know, they're going to have a lot more pricing power. And when they have more pricing power, that's when the government wants to step in and say, okay, well, should we try to limit that? 
So that's on the supply side, right? That's really important in our digital age, but we also have uh, issues on the demand side. So on the demand side, one of the most important issues is this network effect um, where something is more valuable, the more people use it, right? So if you think about Google, if you think about Facebook, you think about Instagram, um, all of these benefit from having more users. Um, and that was true, you know, it was true for Microsoft Office as well. Um, it makes sense for me to use whatever you're using and vice versa. And if that's the case, uh, then we will again end up with more of a natural monopoly, right? It, it makes sense for all of us to use Google, um, which means that the advertisers need to advertise on Google um, rather than, you know, have, you know, a third of us using Google, a third of us using Yahoo, and a third of us using Bing or something, right? That doesn't make sense. And the same with Facebook. You don't want to have a, a social network where your friends, where, you know, half of your friends are using something else. That just doesn't make sense. So we can see, you know, this is sort of the total number of, of users on the horizontal axis and the benefit to a purchaser. Um, and really the benefit increases the more users are using it, right? And so that's, you know, basically what this is saying. Um, we want to all use the same thing. Uh, there you again using the VHS Betamax example, um, but it, it applies, you know, to uh, a lot of things in, in this digital age. Um, and that means that, you know, with that, there's sort of a winner take all competition, right? Which means that we might not use the best um, technology. It could be that Bing is better than Google. Uh, it could be that Betamax is better than VHS. It could be that HD DVD was better than Blu-ray. But once we get locked into one standard, we're going to use that standard. Um, so that's an important uh, distinction that we want to, to keep in mind that in this case, the better technology may not win because of these network effects. 